15 years ago today, Sonic the Hedgehog grew a foot taller, two arms longer, and very spiky and hairy. The reaction at the time was, why do you do that, Sonic? And it's still one of the more puzzling decisions by a developer that struggled to do anything but. Sonic Unleashed is very divisive, literally divided between two very different playstyles, and clearly the first awkward attempts at either. One is agreed to be what the game should have been from the start, as evidenced by most 3D Sonic games since, while the other is an ill-advised experiment that overstays its welcome in every possible way. But looking back, it's clear that Unleashed also finds itself divided between two different eras of the franchise, it marks a turning point where major changes were introduced that have held strong to this day, while other established elements anticipated their end. Ten days before this video's upload, I talked about Sonic Frontiers after its first year of life, and Frontiers is a big step forward for Sonic that would not exist without the groundwork laid by Unleashed so many years ago. With distance comes room for reevaluation. so for its 15th anniversary, Let's look back and reconsider the legacy of Sonic Unleashed. So what if I gave it a bit of a sudden awakening? This is unacceptable! Many people are sick of hearing about Sonic the Hedgehog 2006. But I'm not, and it's relevant, so let's talk about it. It's clear to me in hindsight that 06 was the end of an era that began with Sonic Adventure. The gameplay style and ongoing issues that originated with Adventure hit their nadir here. It was developed by a completely different team that had no experience with that style, headed by a director and a producer who had very little experience in those roles, and then that team got effectively chopped in half to work on Sonic and the Secret Rings. To top it all off, Sonic co-creator, longtime executive, and future laughingstock turned inmate Yuji Naka left Sega. The game was immediately and remains an infamous disaster, and with Sonic Team in a lurch, change wasn't just necessary, but inevitable. In 2008, Sonic Team's San Francisco division, the people who made most of those adventure-era games, were merged back into the Japanese studio. Their head, longtime director Takashi Izuka, would eventually become the head of the entire Sonic Team, and he remains so to this day. But during the period between Yuji Naka and Izuka, Akinori Nishiyama took over as team lead and game producer. He had been the director for Sonic's celebrated portable games developed by Dimps, including the Advanced Trilogy and, most relevant, relevantly, the first Sonic Rush. Rush had introduced a boost system into Sonic's classic 2D gameplay, whereby filling up a meter through defeating enemies or performing tricks, Sonic and Blaze could jump to top speed and blast through the levels. To me, both Sonic 2006 and Sonic Rush feel like the two games that explain why Unleashed was made the way it was. I mean, there's also a third, but we'll talk about that later. Sonic Rush's sequel, in particular, followed in the wake of 06 and the middlingly received Secret Rings, and it got a much more appreciative reception. With Nishiyama leading Sonic Team and taking over as producer by that point, the writing was likely on the wall for where the next 3D game would go. Almost. Originally planned to be the third official Sonic Adventure game, World Adventure, the game diverged from that series so much in development that it took on the new name Sonic Unleashed. Except in Japan, where the name stayed the same. The game had an interesting pre-release, in that everyone saw that Sonic Unleashed had been copyrighted in March 2008, info got leaked, and Sega threatened to sue Destructoid for jokingly reporting on it. Well, Sega really have always sucked, huh? or at least the industry has always hated j Steph. Only a week later, the game was finally confirmed in a press release, and I think Destructoid's follow-up article makes it clear how uphill this game's climb was going to be. In the following months, multiple teasers, trailers, and coverage filled the nascent servers of corporate YouTube. The most iconic is likely the Ring teaser, which was many people's first whiff of dog. A second trailer played up the Werehog bit, though that specific word had yet to be used. The game was revealed to focus in entirely on Sonic and to revamp his gameplay, with the daytime stages being shown first. They were considerably faster and more kinetic than any previous game, even the mock speed sections from 06. Sonic was supposed to be fast, yes, but he'd never been this fast. Having divorced myself from the fandom by this point, I had no knowledge of the wider impressions of this breakneck playstyle, but I imagine they weren't far from that of Kotaku's founder, Brian Crescente. Potentially nauseating? Definitely daunting. I have reason to believe the frame rate was part of it. If GameSpot's E3 coverage is accurate, it was considerably worse before launch. This is an alpha build of this game, correct? 
Correct. So um, a lot of the frame rates uh, and slowdowns that you see here won't actually exist, obviously, in the final version. Uh, yeah, about that. The biggest part of the game's tanking frame rate was the sheer fidelity of its engine. The touted Hedgehog engine was newly developed for Unleashed, led by the game's director and lead designer, Yoshihisa Hashimoto, who would soon leave Sega to go design a whole other engine for Square Enix. He did not end up like Yuji Naka. Hashimoto wanted the game to have graphical fidelity on par with Pixar, and what the Hedgehog engine did best, and which they never quite pushed like this again, was the lighting. The engine pushes global illumination, where light bounces off surfaces to affect everything around where it hits, like it actually does in real life. And because of that, every surface of this game pops when it's hit with light. And they dramatically pulled back on this for later games, except maybe Generations. Even though most of them still use the Hedgehog engine, but perhaps that's also a budget thing, this was the last big budget Sonic for years. Either way, the 360 and PS3 can't handle all the work this engine does, so the frame rate chokes when more than two enemies are on screen. Of course, none of this is an issue in the PS2 and Wii version, which was its own thing developed by Dimps and had a much better handle on its own capabilities. We'll talk about this version separately down the line. For the purposes of this video, I'm using the Xbox Series X for the HD version, which finally fixes the framerate issues by giving the game the horsepower it always needed and never really had, a nice stable 60fps. I'd also played it on the Xbox One some years back, but I have no footage or memory of its quality, so instead I emulated the PS3 version for comparison while I was writing this script. I'm sure it runs better than the actual console, but the lag from it compiling shaders is an effective simulation. I'll also be emulating the Wii version down the line, since that's a stable way to play it. Finally, gameplay trailers revealed the Werehog to the world, a slower hack-and-slash playstyle visibly inspired by God of War, a series that practically ate the PS2 whole near the end of its lifespan. The more things change, eh? Players immediately found the concept questionable. I mean, obnoxious gameplay gimmicks had been a problem since the first Sonic Adventure, you're still insisting on it? After the disaster that was Sonic 06? And at the exact same time that the daytime stages are clearly pushing Sonic forward in the right direction? This always felt like a transparently desperate aping of a different popular game series to try to pull Sonic out of the deep end, something they would continue to attempt for years to come. But I will say I appreciate the developer's reasoning behind it. Sonic is known for using his legs, so they contrasted that with a powerhouse form that instead uses his arms. Whether you think Sonic should ever be doing anything other than running is a personal question. And the fact that they already had a perfect character for that idea who's nowhere to be seen in this game is its own head-scratcher. But if Unleashed was always going to focus exclusively on playing Sonic no matter what, then at least within those terms, it makes sense to me. Sure, God of War-style monster smashing. Whether it's too much of a contrast or not is another matter. November 18, 2008, the game is officially released in North America. Critical response is mixed to negative, with most publications preferring Dimp's SD version, though only so much more. People did not like the Werehog, how he played, how slow he moved, and just how much of the game was him, compared to the vastly preferred daytime levels. Some reviewers thought he just flatly had no place in a Sonic game. Suffice to say, he never returned, and the boost gameplay stuck around instead. But those were contemporary reviews from major publications after, at most, a few weeks' time on underpowered hardware. It's been 15 years since, and it's now available in a form that runs how it always should have. Though, like I hinted earlier, I did not play this game back then, let alone until these last few years. But I've still had a lot longer to absorb this game under the best possible conditions. I've had time to consider its pros and cons, make peace with the Werehog, and find things within it that I can genuinely love or at least see an ideal version from a perfect universe. So with 15 years, two console generations, and several games built off this framework behind us, let's dig into the version of the game that puts its best foot forward, and we'll see what we make of it today. From here on out, this video is open spoilers. If you haven't played the game and would prefer to learn all this yourself, 
you have been warned. Also, this isn't going to be a point-by-point -point recap and analysis where I closely follow the story, like in my previous video. At least not once we're completely out of the tutorial. I want to look at the game as a broader package, so I'm going to be jumping ahead to later worlds or story beats as I discuss my points. Hence the open spoilers. And since this is a 15-year retrospective, I'm looking at Unleashed in the context of when it was released and what came before, and in the context of everything that's happened since. Expect comparisons to everything from Adventure 1 through Frontiers. So this is probably going to be a bit different from my previous videos. But for now, let's start somewhere very important and very trans-lesbian. Gopping at the pretty thing. There's a lot that's already been said about the intro cutscene. The stellar fluid animation, the visual fidelity, the action. Shadow and 06 had great CGI cutscenes, sporadic as they were, but this one tops them easily by feeling like a Sonic short film. Him versus the entire Eggman space fleet, done as cool and pretty as possible. Not even the movies look this good. Sonic goes super and toasts Eggman's invasion. Or so it seems. The Doc manages to trick Sonic into a trap where he pulls the Chaos Emeralds out of him and drains their power to awaken Dark Gaia, a malevolent deity asleep beneath the Earth's crust. At the same time, Gaia's influence turns Sonic into the long and spiky Werehog. <laughs> sealed within the planet has awakened. Now I just need to harness its power. Eggman Land will finally come to be! <laughs> You've really gone and done it this time, Eggman. Ah, oh, Sonic, that's a good look for you. Festive. So long, friend. Huh? <laughs> Sonic and the Drained Emeralds get flung into space, and the game begins. One of the stronger, more arresting intros for Sonic at the time, and still one of the best. We transition from a pre-rendered cutscene to in-engine, which is not quite as pretty, but that's just because the sun hasn't come up yet, give it time. Sonic splats into the outskirts of Apatos, where he meets a sleeping, amnesiac, flying chihuahua. Hey, are you okay? Mm, can't. I can't eat another bite. Hey, pull yourself together! Uh, huh? Huh? Oh. <laughs> Don't eat me! I taste bad! The little guy is silly and cartoony, which is something we'll address in a bit, but the poor thing can't even remember his own name right now. Sonic knows a travel buddy when he sees one, so he takes the little fellow with him into town to find someone who might know him. The sun rises, and he returns to normal. The funny thing about these in-engine cutscenes, it meant that they were as susceptible to the framerate drops as the rest of the game. This was one of the ways the SD version was better, because the cutscenes were pre-rendered for it, and thus didn't have to worry about that. Here, the scene is playing as it was always supposed to. It's oddly heartwarming. The game begins proper with a short, easy run through Windmill Isle Act 1. And god, this game is pretty. <laughs> All of your core skills for the daytime levels are taught to you here in what's essentially a tutorial. If you're coming back to this game from later releases, especially Frontiers like I am, you'll notice that you're missing a lot of your toolkit. Sonic can't stomp, lightspeed dash, he can't even jump off walls yet. These are instead skills you unlock as you go through the game, as you're forced to find the upgrades around the hub world, said Adventure 1 style before you can progress at certain points. However, this is also the period when Sonic gave up on the spin dash entirely. And after Final Horizon, I hope he never makes that mistake again. Spin to win, baby! Another thing you might notice in this first level, especially if you're coming back after a long time, Sonic's controls feel off. Turning at high speed has a bit of weight to it, which is fine with how these levels are largely corridors. You're just moving forward. But then everything else has a lot of weird weight to it too. Pressing the jump button makes him do a small, useless hop. You actually need to hold the button down to make it useful, and it's awkwardly ponderous to maneuver. Slowing to a stop makes him hell to control as he goes sliding off everywhere with no hope for precision. 
I'm aware of the Unleashed project, a mod for Generations that imports the daytime levels, but I'd most like to see these stages with the Frontiers playstyle, even the throttled controls from Cyberspace. They feel so much better to me than Unleashed does at a baseline. It is just too loose and slippery to be comfortable. And the later game asks you to do quite a bit of precise platforming with Daytime Sonic that becomes needlessly fatal because of it. That speed adjustment menu couldn't come soon enough. That said, when I first completed Frontiers and discussed it with my friend Jacob, I posited whether my enjoyment of it could retroactively make its predecessors better for me. An admittedly vague notion, but it at least happened in one way. Players coming from the adventure games didn't like that the homing attack was now on a separate button from the jump, and I remember having trouble with that as well. But coming back from Frontiers, which did the same thing, but allowed you to homing attack without needing to jump, so it was easier to separate it in my mind from the jump button, I was able to back translate that to Unleashed. So in at least one way, Frontiers did make this easier for me to play. We'll get into some other mechanics like this leveling system in the next stage. What do you figure that was all about? The hair, and those arms, and, and look at the Chaos Emeralds! So, is this what you usually look like? Yeah, this is the real me. Pretty cool, huh? Jason Griffith definitely got comfortable as Sonic in 2008 in a way that he never really felt beforehand, considering Roger also took a while to get his voice right. Drop the critters, Eggman! I think it's fair to narrow it down to a directing problem, especially with how good and organic he sounded in Boom and Frontiers. I still don't think Jason ever sounded as good in the role as Roger or Ryan, but if he had his own Frontiers, it was probably unleashed. His unnatural, bouncing inflections are still here, but tempered to a level that they don't stick out so much anymore. His performance is more organic this time, actually feeling like he's present in a scene and is part of the world talking to other people. It's still not the American 90s radical doofus that Ryan and Jaleel pulled off from day one, but it's more like the chill creature of whimsy that Sonic is in Japan. Yes, even the Werehog. You get used to the silly growling pretty quickly since the performance underneath still feels relatively grounded. And according to the poor guy himself, he got sick just before recording. I'm pretty sure I started a cleanse or something. I just met a, a guy who owned a health food store below the building I lived in, and uh, he recommended all these juice remedies. And I was like, oh, this is great, and then pff, I got sick. Um, and so I just remember that session was so demanding, you know, but there was no way that we could have done it the week after because everybody had flown in from San Francisco and, and Japan, and... Um, you know, that would have just been a horrible inconvenience. So, you know, like like what happens, you just have to you just have to push through. Um, and I, I didn't have I went to the doctor, I didn't have strep, and I'm pretty sure it was the, the cleanse that I was doing that made me really sick, but um, I was drinking a lot of soup. <laughs> I was just <laughs> guzzling soup while we were recording that. And uh, I want to say there was like a week. We did a whole week of recording. So some days were better and some days were just like, oh, like I could have just, if they would have wheeled a bed in and given me like five minute breaks to just fall asleep, I would have. That deserves commendation. Hell, him going <laughs> has more life in it than the entirety of 06. As Sonic is showing himself off, his new friend ditches him to drool over an extravagant ice cream cone, establishing a deceptively important character trait. More on that later. He and Sonic each get a cone and as shown later in colors, Sonic just calls people whatever the fuck he wants. You need to get out of your trans fuckboy phase, Sonic. So he names his new friend Chip, after the chocolate chips on the ice cream. Chip? Gotta call you something, don't I? What do you think? Yeah, Chip! Chip! I love it! Yum! Now what do you say we start asking around and see if anybody here knows you? Okay. Chip is voiced by Tony Salerno, who I will mistake for Tony Anselmo at some point. <laughs> Like Jason, Tony has a laid-back charm to his voice that prevents Chip's antics from getting too obnoxious. It's a very silly, cartoony character, which is something of a tonal whiplash after the previous nine years, and we'll talk more about that after a few more levels, but I think it helps that Chip is so affable. He's friendly and curious in a way where it's charming to watch him discover a world he's clearly not familiar with and come to appreciate and enjoy it, and he and Sonic feel like friends right away. He could have been done so much worse. 
From here, we're able to slip slide uncomfortably around the town, speak to the locals, and break all their pottery. Sadly, no one recognizes Chip, but Gregorios does point us to the entrance stage, the hub area for Apatos' levels. There are some side paths around here with collectibles, but they're all locked off until we're completely through the tutorial, which effectively lasts until we leave Apatos. We jump right into Windmill Isle Act 2, the first full-length daytime stage, which also establishes the core gameplay loop of Unleashed. We have a long race across a gorgeous landscape where we don't need to worry about speed per se. Getting a good time will get you a better rank at the end, but mostly we're here to explore. We've got more room to breathe than it feels like at first, as like a classic Sonic level, there are alternate paths you can find as you get better at the game. Many of these require quick reflexes and likely multiple retries to nail, but down each of them is several collectibles, concept art and pieces of an entire bestiary, music for the sound test, video clips from the game to re-watch, and if you grab them but die, the game will still count it as long as you finish the level. I appreciate that. What makes these levels tough for me is the same problem that Sonic's had since Heroes. The level design frequently clashes with the unnatural slipperiness of your movement. Later levels expect you to do platforming over bottomless pits that require much tighter deceleration than you have. It was a good thing in Frontiers, damn it. Call it heresy, but in the long run, I find the daytime stages much more actively aggravating. Especially the bonus stages. Fucking nightmares. On that note, the most important collectibles you need to look out for are the sun and moon medals. This is a hugely contentious aspect of the game. You must collect a certain amount of these to increase your sun level, which allows you to access new daytime stages, and your moon level for nighttime stages. Progress locked entirely behind Behind the junk you collect in a level, rather than simply completing that level like in games past and future. I would prefer that it weren't the requirement, but I will say that it's not as frustrating as it looks on first blush. Finding the medals in the daytime stages is by far the hardest, as that chaotic slipperiness makes any precision or recovery from mistakes extremely difficult. But as you get a handle on the controls, you'll pick up enough medals to cover you. You'll have outside options to get more medals, like from the souvenirs or finding them in the hub worlds. But the majority the majority of the medals will actually be collected in the nighttime stages, and we better get to the Werehog, shouldn't we? Upon completing Act 2, our heroes return to Apatos in the evening, with Chip disappointed that they can't find anyone who knows him. I like his little bouncy people walk. The sun sets, and Sonic painfully transforms back into the Werehog. Oh. Sonic? Mr. Monster Guy is back! Uh, uh, so when the sun goes down, I turn into this? Are you okay, Sonic? I'm fine. I just need to be careful who sees me like this. Sonic! Sonic, look! What is it? Oh, it's hopeless! <laughs> the whole planet is split apart! We're doomed! <laughs> mister? Oh. Hey, mister! <laughs> hey, don't cry! Uh, ice cream! How about some more of this super tasty stuff? What good is ice cream at a time like this? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <Whoops. laughs> Sonic, your arm just stretched! Weird. <laughs> but it could be useful. Put a pin in all of this. So now we're controlling the Werehog for the first time. Compared to regular Sonic, he's much slower as a baseline, though he can dash and pick up a decent head of speed. His gameplay is instead of God of War style hack and slash, where we chain together light and heavy attacks and sometimes jumps into combos. It's a surprisingly extensive moveset, but like Sonic's daytime skills, we need to unlock most of them first. 
As we talk to the locals, some of whom seem to be going through the same thing as Dan Green over there, a few mention seeing a two-tailed fox heading towards the entrance stage. Tails, we just came from there, how did you miss us? Once there, we see Act 2 is shut off, and a new blue stage is open for us. A little more of the background has been opened up, but we can only collect a single record right now. There'll be more later, since this is still effectively the tutorial. We enter Nighttime Act 1, and see my son being threatened by monsters. They're all dead! Settle down, guys! Come on! I don't know how people felt about this scene back in the day. Not like a similar scene in Forces, which I know everyone hated, but I think Frontiers put this pretty reliably in a perspective. He's a goddamn kid and the world is ending. Let him be scared and call for his big bro to protect him. He's still growing. We're now let loose to cause a new kind of mayhem in the streets of Apatos. We actually do most of the things we did as a hedgehog, but now with our claws instead of our face. We no longer have rails, bumpers, or boost rings to take us to new paths. We have to jump and climb there ourselves. Everything you can interact with is clearly visible, especially ledges which literally glow, and where Hognik doesn't take them as slowly as you'd think. You actually have a much wider margin of error than it looks if you miss a platform, at least as far as the grass just jumping and falling, well, let's get into that. In the long run, I actually think the Werehog controls more reliably than regular Sonic, at least for this one game, where he's so slippery and unreliable in the boost stages that it's hard to accomplish anything first try. I feel like I have much more control here, even if jumping and dashing is a bit slippery unto itself. However, he has three big problems unique to him. One, his platforming animations and acceleration are oddly loose and arrhythmic. There's an awkward delay before he actually does anything, so it's hard to get a groove down when you're platforming. He never seems to move at a consistent pace. Two, the slower speed of the nighttime levels is not so much an issue as just how dramatically it's been slowed. These are very long stages, taking upwards of 15 minutes, to say nothing of Eggman land, that's for later. Because every world has one core, daytime, and nighttime stage each, that makes the balance of this game hugely out of whack in favor of the Werehog. But even that in itself isn't the core problem, as you can move faster as the Werehog than his reputation, and the early levels manage to not feel as long as they really are. No, it's not about his movement speed or the size of the stage. It's how heavily you get stopped in your tracks for identical and repetitive combat encounters. Frequently, you will have your path locked off by a group of enemies that you have to defeat, which only gets more and more arbitrary the more it happens. And often, it's meant to be a surprise that doesn't activate until you approach where the barrier spawns in. It stops being a surprise. Very few of these encounters will be unique in any significant way, and if they are, it's because of an obnoxious gimmick like Wizards on Fire, it's nowhere as awesome as it sounds. Defeating enemies does give you Chaos Orbs, which you use to level up Sonic. We can unpin that now. Generally, you don't need to worry about leveling up your daytime stats. Instead, save your experience for increasing the Werehog's strength and combat stats. More strength will make these fights go much faster, and the more combos you unlock, the more varied you can actually make a fight. The uppercut and follow-up aerial spin also let you see sequence break and get through these levels even faster. Very recommended, even in a casual playthrough. Don't forget to fill up your Unleash gauge by smashing random objects to also make fights go faster. Some levels will let you bypass these encounters if it's by a door that you can open with a switch or by grabbing and lifting it, or the sequence break maneuver, and trust me, if it's there, you'll want to go for it. And issue number three, I think the biggest of the game, the camera, the mortal enemy of any Sonic player. It's primarily locked into a track at the most unhelpful angle with very little useful adjustment you can make. The grand majority of your deaths can be blamed on your poor depth perception, which is a consistent problem that never gets better. That wide margin of error doesn't mean diddly to gravity. If there's anything I do like about the Werehog stages, it's not so much the platforming as the general exploration. We have much 
less in the way of alternate paths, it's more that the collectibles have been snuck away deep into the corners and pockets of the level. And this is why I say you'll get most of your medals at night time, because searching this stuff out is easily the most fun thing you'll do here. Their hiding spots start out pretty well signposted, but they get much sneakier in later levels, some of them properly testing your platforming skills to collect. If you're having trouble finding the medals in daytime, this is likely where you're going to get the grand majority. And it covered most of the stages for me in my first full playthrough on Series X. But while we're on the subject of good things, let's talk about this game's music. Unleashed is fighting a deadlock match with Frontiers as my number one favorite Sonic soundtrack. Tomoya Otani and crew were just flexing. He took over from Jun Sonoe as the lead sound director with those six, but I honestly couldn't tell anything had changed until I actually read that it wasn't Sonoe in charge. It was a great soundtrack too, easily its best part, like a lot of this messy era of Sonic. But it felt like Otani and his collaborators were just continuing the musical palette of the adventure era. This is very much them coming into their own and spreading their legs. The compositions are so wonderfully melodic, vibrant, and eclectic. Every region adopts instruments and composition techniques from its real-world inspiration, so if you like Middle Eastern music, Sub-Saharan African music, and accordions like I do, then yeah, it's fantastic. The daytime stages amp up the energy into high tempos, as you'd expect, and I don't think there's a dud among them. The nighttime stages mix it up in a fun way, though. They lean much more into jazz, and they have some of the most playful compositions, very different from a lot of Sonic stage music. Shout out to Fumie Kumatani, the unsung world champion of Sega music, who owns so much of this game, and was just on another level anytime she contributed to Sonic. She did Mystic Ruins in Adventure 1, she did Shadows and Rouge's music in SA2, and I always think of her themes when I think of those characters, not Jun Sanoe which says something about their decline over the years, doesn't it? Most of the nighttime stages and many of the town themes were composed by Kumatani, including Apatos, as well as the deceptively cute tornado defense theme, and almost all of it is some of my very favorite music in the entirety of Sonic. Though credit also to Tomoyo Otani for some banging daytime stage themes, Cool Edge is another all-time favorite. And Kenichi Tokoi did amazing work with Spagonia, Shamar, and Chunnan. It's just a wonderfully varied and confident soundtrack. It's music so good it makes me angry. Though there is one track that makes me angry, but in the wrong way. Sing along if you know this one. <laughs> Yes, as good as the nighttime music is, you don't hear it nearly as much as you should, because the Werehog has a blaring fight theme that starts playing any time any enemy gets within spitting distance of you. This doesn't feel like it should be an issue, since the music is a really cool, rollicking jazz blowout. But remember, these fights are so constant, so disruptive, that this theme quickly stops being entertaining or even awkwardly funny and just starts being annoying. By only the second nighttime stage, you'll want to mute the game and play the stage theme separately, especially when it blares for passive enemies you use for puzzles. I'm starting to think the Werehog wasn't thought through very well. We finish up Windmill Isle with a big arena full of enemies and the first mini-boss. Hi Tails! Big enemies aren't too much of an issue, but they do have the annoying tendency to send out shockwaves that knock you down if you don't see them coming and jump over them. And they knock you down twice, thanks for that. This is where I should mention the critical finishers. Do enough damage to medium to large enemies, and you get the option to try a short quick time event to finish them off for bonus points. Generally, you don't want to attempt these until their health is halfway down, as the healthier they are, the faster the timer on the button prompts, and if you mess up your inputs or the timer runs out, the enemy knocks you on your ass and recovers all of their health. For my final big tangent of Apatos, let's go into my problems with the game's quick time events. These are scattered throughout the game in both stage types. For daytime, they're either a series of random inputs you need to press so that Sonic can launch himself to a higher path, and eventually a path period, or wall jumping pads over bottomless pits with either a fixed or random input, depending on what image is on the pad. For the Werehog, they're primarily the finishers and are mostly optional, though they're encouraged if you want to get enough points for an S rank. Don't count on your time or ring bonuses to carry you there. There are also two flying segments with the Tornado that call back to the two arcade shooter sections from Adventure 1, but instead of controlling the plane, you just press random buttons again. 
What really bugs me about the QTEs is that you can't get good at them. Not in the way you can practice the quick reaction obstacles in the daytime levels, at least. I'm bad at those too, but they're there for a reason, and I can accept that. Press B to slide underneath a wall for a faster route. I get that, it makes sense, and crucially, it follows the logic of your controls. But almost every QTE is just a random collection of buttons, and they're re-randomized every single time, and they don't correspond to any of your abilities. So no matter how many times you practice a level, you can never truly practice the QTEs. And some of the later timers are so short in a way that's really only acceptable if the combos were the same every time. To wit, the only exception to this is the Werehog Dark Gaia boss fights, where the QTEs do correspond to your grab, jump, punch, etc., and therefore can actually be practiced. There's logic there you can follow. Regular Werehog finishers don't. And also some of the other Werehog bosses. Game, what are you doing? QTEs are an aspect of the game that was very of its time and has aged very poorly. I prefer how colors and generations do it. They are very simplistic there, dropping it down to only one button usually. But at least you actually know what you're supposed to do. I wondered if the timer speed was a result of the higher frame rate literally speeding them up, so I looked up some older videos from the PS3 and 360. This is an S-rank run of Eggman Land by Anon7906, and it's actually hard to tell a difference from this. The timing seems to be about the same. If anything, your inputs are a little more responsive on the Series X. That kind of makes it worse. I hate these. If you go unleashed, do enough damage, and then do the QTE, the big guy should go down relatively easily. And that's kind of the Werehog on the whole to me. It's a far less exciting, far more repetitive playstyle that massively outweighs the most exciting and engaging part of the game. Only a few towns in, the Werehog levels will already be so long and redundant that they'll lose whatever fun they had. It's a shame, because I don't mind these levels on paper or in a vacuum and frankly, I find them easier to get a handle on than the daytime stages. I'm bad at Sonic games, I've been over this. There's a perfect integration of this playstyle into a Sonic game out there in the ether, and I think it comes down to an overhaul of the level design itself. If they were just shorter and allowed you more freedom of movement throughout them, I think the Werehog would be a lot less derided. But as he stands, his gaping handful of issues keep him from actually being good. Hey, Tails! Sonic? What are you doing out here? Sonic, is that really you? That's a new look. What happened? You know me. Never a dull moment. Want some chocolate? Uh, thanks. Amy Palin was never my favorite Tails voice. Adult cis women voicing young boys is business as usual in voice acting, but she never got her voice to sound natural in the role, being so high-pitched and airy that it drew attention to itself. But like Jason, Unleashed managed to be the closest she'd have to an organic performance. If anything, it sounds like she lowered her pitch into a place that sits better, but it still sounds like an adult approximating a child. I think her successors, Kate and Colleen, just had a better knack for it. That's some story. I'll bet that means that you turning into that and the planet breaking apart are somehow related. I need to find Eggman and make him fix this, <laughs> and <laughs> fast! About that, I think I know someone who might know something about what's going on here. Oh, really? <laughs> Professor Pickle over at Spagonia University. I came to this city to gather some data. If we add that to his research findings, we might be able to get to the bottom of all this. Spagonia? That's a continent over. An easy jog if the planet weren't broken. No problem. My Tornado One will get us there in a flash. Let's get going! Leave it to you, Tails. Let's get moving.
From here, we have the first Tornado Defense QTE minigame, which I've already made clear I'm not a fan of, but the music is a delight and I get to hang with Tails, so I can live with it anyway. We blow up Eggman's flying cauldron thing, and then it's down to Spagonia. All of its rooftops coming through the clouds is such a cool way to transition to a new region. This game looks so damn good, though I'm glad we only have to do that minigame one more time. Spagonia is a place where the level designers went all out. Every storefront along your path is littered with details. Food and drink for sale, an active barber shop, a restaurant just down the road from the university, the fountain fixture at the school's entrance, and the place is filled with unique NPCs, all with their own side stories and personalities. I love how alive and bustling every town feels. Even the tiny little villages like in Missouri, or the lone families living in Holaska or Adabat, they still feel feel lived in. The fantastic music certainly helps. It makes every town feel full of personality. I just think it's rad that a Sonic game has Gamelon music. The people themselves have very interesting designs. As I mentioned, director Yoshihisa Hashimoto wanted the game to have the fidelity of a Pixar film, and the caricature-inspired designs for the humans often feel like the devs tried to make it look specifically like a Pixar film. Except, you know, an old one, because by 2008, their humans looked more like this. Uh -huh. Now, the problem with these designs is not their exaggerated look. No, that actually makes them fit in a Sonic's world a lot better than how incongruous they were before. The problem is that this was the last 3D Sonic to primarily animate the characters with motion capture. It's a quick and dirty way to create animation data for 3D characters, and for more realistic art direction like Naughty Dog's games, or at least realistic human proportions like in Nino Kuni or Genshin Impact, I think it can slot in just fine, as long as the facial animation is detailed. But it's very hard to make non-realistic characters, and especially exaggerated art styles, look anything other than uncanny. Let's look back on Sonic, for example. Adventure 2's cutscenes look ridiculous because these colorful, anthropomorphic animal people with exaggerated body and limb proportions move like real humans. It's what Dan from New Frame Plus called the mascot suit problem. Nobody moves like how animated characters should. They move more like humans inside of mascot suits. But as far as Unleashed, I think 06 might be the best point of comparison, because the humans, as much as they clash against Sonic and friends in their design, Design, feel comparatively a lot less uncanny in their movements because they're realistically proportioned. Elise has a stylized, anime-ish appearance, but she has the shape of a real person. The regular NPCs do just flap their arms a lot, but I think that's a case of nobody knowing what these people should be doing. It's not uncanny, it's just goofy. But then we arrive at Unleashed, where the caricature human designs finally fit alongside Sonic, but everyone's still animated with motion capture. Now, even more than Adventure 2 sometimes, these actual humans feel like walking mascot suits, and it only gets worse the further into the game it goes. There's a cutscene in the climax of the game where the faces and bodies of these people are in combat with each other. They look so uncanny. And we've seen this problem in the game already. Chip's movement immediately sticks out in his introductory cutscene the second they switch to motion capture and he starts running like a person. It's especially noticeable to me with Tails, because his motion actor constantly looks like they don't know what to do with their hands. Which is actually excellent nerd representation, I forgive this now. But Sonic himself, I think, looks good and fluid in the way you'd want for these characters. And that's how the game started to look after this, when they switched to animating by hand. It took Sonic Team a while to make it look particularly good, though, since the animators still didn't know how to make everyone's exaggerated hands and eyes expressive, but they figured it out by the time of Frontiers. And of course, Sonic Boom redesigned the characters in ways that made them move much more pleasingly as well. My guess is motion capture was a holdover from Yuji Naka's tenure, and I say that entirely because of Bal and Wonderworld. <laughs> to our great horror, the professor has been kidnapped by Eggman, and after talking to people around town, someone is able to tell that they were headed to the Africa-styled Missouri. We don't need to do the tornado minigame this time, and we arrive at the local village at night. So an hour and a half into the game, and we've already gone from the first long werehog stage to the next, back to back. This one especially has some camera chicanery that's needlessly obnoxious, but at the very least, it's a good place to put that sequence break to use, so it's another stage that doesn't feel as long as it is. 
and the last. Thankfully, our reward is the charming introduction to another character I like a lot, our missing Professor Pickle, also voiced by Dan Green. This guy may be a fussy, posh scholar type, but he is such a chad that he's ready to march to Eggman's face and tell him his cucumber sandwiches are shit. He's the one human where the motion capture enhances the character, because it means he actually walks like an energetic old man who doesn't realize or care that he's old. Pickle rules. Professor Pickle! Are you alright? We got here as fast as we could. Hmm. Professor? Um, hello? How dare they call this culinary concoction food? <sighs> Look here, do you see this sorry excuse for a sandwich? The bread should be no less than three quarters of an inch thick. Upon it, one tablespoon of mayonnaise and a pinch of black pepper. The contents, fresh cucumber, sliced thinly, if you please. Am I quite right, Dale? I know I learned something here today. Professor, it's good to see you haven't changed. But tell me, what brings you here? The menu is hardly worth the trip, if you ask me. No, Professor. We came here to rescue you. Oh? Oh, I see. How rude of me. Right then, first things first. It's about time someone taught the chef here how to make a proper sandwich. You can file a complaint later, Professor. Let's get out of here before Eggman's welcoming committee shows up. Oh, yes, quite. But let us be sure to collect the contents of that vault before departing. Uh, ah! ah, thank you. Those documents are our only hope for surviving this crisis. Let's go. There's no time to lose. I'm half starved after being fed nothing but those terrible sandwiches. Want some chocolate, Professor? My, my. Don't mind if I do. We take the professor back to Spagonia, where he gives us our core objectives. Find the seven Gaia temples around the world, each of which will restore the power of one of the Chaos Emeralds and put the pieces of the planet back in place. The first temple is back in Missouri, and while we're gone, he'll search the Gaia manuscripts to find where the next is hidden. The planet's power will restore the Chaos Emeralds, and in turn, the Chaos Emeralds will restore the planet and help it heal naturally. We return to Missouri during the day, where the villagers are dealing with Eggman like absolute heroes. Get out of here! Who do you think you are? Who are you? <laughs> Fear not, my good villagers. If you all behave, I won't have to do anything nasty. All you need to do is tell me where the Temple of Gaia is. for that little skydiving adventure the other day. I should have known you'd still be alive, you stubborn little hedgehog. What are you doing out here? I see no reason to tell you. In any case, I'm busy. Farewell! Huh? Hey, wait! That's playing dirty! Come back! Just ignore him. Is everyone here all right? Almost as if to make up for the Werehog doubleheader, we get the next daytime stage and the first boss back to back. Savannah Citadel is one of the more iconic Unleashed stages, really showing off the color and the lighting in a striking way. And as someone who's gone through it a few times, excluding its reuse in Frontiers, this feels like one of the better balanced daytime stages. Not too many bottomless pits, takes just enough skill and awareness to get to the top route or get an S rank, two QTEs that aren't too bullshit. Good level. And then we run into Eggman again. If you need more proof that IQ means nothing, the Egg Beetle is not a hard boss, but it does introduce some minor recurring annoyances with Eggman's mechs. You can take them down relatively quickly if you make good timed use of your boost and slam your face into the cockpit. 
but every boss arena has sun and moon medals to collect. It's a good idea to find where they are and focus on grabbing them first, just to bolster your count. Except the battles also transition into side-scrollers, during which the medals are despawned, and you can't hit the boss. If you're actually good at finding the medals during the stages, you can probably skip this and just boost the fight to completion, because otherwise these can drag on for minutes, and we don't need any more of that. Don't worry about your ring count for the S rank, your time bonus is more important. The boss complete, Sonic and Chip notice a nearby building. Is that the Temple of Gaia? Let's check it out! I love how much character there was in just that one small bit, and the scene immediately after. These two already feel so comfortable with each other, it's really charming. Chip investigates the pedestal, and if you pay attention, you'll notice that it reacts when his necklace starts to glow. Sonic cautiously drops in the emerald. This was the Temple of Gaia! That's gotta be why Eggman was so keen on taking the place over! Tails flies in to show the two that the chunk of the planet is now back in place. From here, we now have the freedom to explore the continents we've unlocked, buy stuff in the shops, start some side quests, and switch back and forth between night and day. We're finally released from the tutorial. Now, you know me. Even if this is the first of my videos you're watching, you saw my background, you know Tails is my favorite. And yes, as you might be able to hazard already, he doesn't have a huge presence in the story. He is an active driving force and is always around, usually waiting by the exit of each town with the tornado or with the professor. But despite him being Sonic's best bud, and as much as I love the two as a pair, the story's just not about him. It's about Sonic's friendship and journey with Chip. You would probably think that I, therefore, am deeply insulted and wish this were just a Sonic and Tails story. It might have actually been the good one, too. But no, I'm actually okay with the story not focusing on Tails, for two main reasons. One, I find Chip's character, his arc, and his friendship with Sonic genuinely endearing. Look at these two scenes we just watched. If he was an annoying little asshole, then yeah, I'd wish they hadn't. But thankfully, he's much more balanced a presence and personality than you'd think. And two... Sonic's journey with Chip is one he couldn't necessarily have with Tails, at least not in the way that it plays out. To explain what I mean, let's talk about this story. Do I need a reason to want to help out a friend? Thanks, Sonic. This is the point where I want to drop the beat-by-beat -beat recap and look at the game through a wider lens. The plot isn't very complicated, the levels don't differentiate significantly in how they play, just in how obnoxious they are. The characters don't have much in the way of arcs outside of Sonic and Chip. This isn't a huge criticism, it's kind of the bedrock for the next decade of mainline games, where the story takes a backseat to the gameplay, and fingers crossed it'll actually feel good to play. Chip's cartoony background antics even kind of set the stage for games like Colors, Lost World, and Generations to be lighter and sillier, leading right up to an actual cartoon with Boom. But here's the thing. A lot of that period was charmless. Starting with Colors, the games were mostly written by actual TV comedy and animation writers Ken Pontak and Warren Graff, but I feel like they were never really comfortable writing for this series or got to actually put their skills to use. Stuck with plots written by someone else with characters that they did not know very well and were likely rewritten or retranslated to unrecognizability, the scripts all came out flat, ponderous, and even insulting. Generations is only the most endearing of this period because Classic Tales is my perfect baby boy, and Classic Sonic doesn't talk. And that's not a diss. Forcing a character to be charming entirely through body language works so much better when you have no charming dialogue. This is why I'll stand up for Chip. His cartooniness was a big tonal shift after the darker and more mature stories from the adventure era. 
Whether that was the right change or not. One word of helpful advice, diet and exercise. Diet, three words. History lanes not, but the darker stuff wasn't working anymore, so Sonic needed to lighten up. And Chip actually works for me here because, while him being a goober can be distracting, it's not usually disrupting. Aside from a couple cutscenes early on, like the one where he briefly dies, Yes, really. The game is good about not lingering on him. It's just the sound mixing puts his background noise at the same level as the actual dialogue. For the most part, he's just a little ball of eagerness. Compare him enjoying some tea while the characters discuss the Gaia manuscripts to Sonic having one-sided smack talk with robots that don't respond for minutes on end. I'll happily take Chip's bit of being friendly and offering chocolate to everyone over the Boom Villagers bits of ruining the show. And despite its simplicity, there is a story here worth fleshing out. At least a couple themes that get touched on. One of them feels pretty obvious as a theme for a globetrotting adventure, but you don't regularly see it in action unless you do side quests for all the NPCs. But the more you do, and the more of the planet you put back in place, the more you meet people mirroring your adventure. People travel from their homes to the other continents to follow their dreams of being a singer, or to find and kidnap their soulmate, or to sample every tea in the world to make the ultimate chai. In a very subtle way that it never draws attention to, the game becomes almost utopian. There are no language barriers, no countries you can't visit or emigrate to to follow your dreams or to follow a whim, no real judgments about people based on what land they're from, only some questioning of their medical experience. The planet was divided by Eggman and Dark Gaia, but you not only put its pieces back in place, you see how much those divisions don't belong. This is a planet entirely without borders. But there's a more personal story happening here too. Sonic and Chip working through their senses of self. We see this the most with Chip since figuring out who he is and getting his memory back is one of the focal points of the plot. Not knowing causes him distress, but from the beginning, he consistently stays a positive presence. He loves discovering food and is always offering everyone chocolate, and I mean everyone, even the guardian phoenix of Chunnan that we just beat up to free it from Dark Gaia. He's friendly, brave, playful, and silly in ways that would bring to mind Scrappy-Doo if he didn't actually keep his mouth shut most of the time. But it's not until you beat Eggman in the penultimate world of Adabat that you finally learn the truth. My... My real name is Light Gaia. I draw power from the day and light, and guide the planet to its rebirth. My job was to protect the planet from Dark Gaia. But Eggman broke the world apart himself, and Dark Gaia and I were awakened before we should have been. That's why Dark Gaia broke apart, and I didn't know who I was. I didn't remember what I was supposed to do. All because this isn't the proper time of awakening. Time of awakening? Dark Gaia grows over millions of years, then rises to destroy the world. And I put it all back together. We've been doing this over and over, again and again, since the very beginning of time. So you were asleep all this time? For millions of years? Yes for ages and ages. I bet it's thanks to you. Mm -hmm. Even at night when I'm like this, I'm still myself, not like all the other people we've seen. You must have been protecting me this whole time. Mm-mm. I haven't done anything, Sonic. You're the reason you haven't changed at all. You're too strong to lose yourself. I'm the reason? Yeah. You never doubt yourself, no matter what. You never give in to the night or the darkness inside your heart. I think it's because I knew that about you. That's why I wanted you to help me. It's been so fun getting to see the world. I've lived here since the planet began, but... I didn't know a thing about it. That it's so pretty, or that food tastes so good, or that people are so nice. I'm so glad I got the chance to discover all that with you, and I'm so glad that you helped me find my memory. Sonic, I will never, ever forget you. Thank you, Sonic. 
His arc reveals itself to be an odd but sweet story about humanizing a god and celebrating the little things that seem normal, even mundane to mortal people. Like the subtle utopianism of the broader game, it's about how the world is a big wonderful thing worth exploring for all its small wonderful things. Cause even gods love chocolate and ice cream. But what's not touched on nearly enough is how Chip is not the only one experiencing this internal conflict. So is Sonic. Being turned into the Werehog at night doesn't seem to throw him off much, he takes to it pretty well, and he seems to appreciate being powerful and stretchy. When he turns back to normal in the daytime, he shows himself off with pride, which you can take as just him being egotistical. But then they run into Amy while he's the Werehog, and she tackles him as usual. But then she doesn't recognize him. She apologizes for yet another mistaken identity and runs off. Chip rationalizes it as just because he's scary looking now. But instead of laughing it off or anything, Sonic is actually really upset by this and sadly slumps away. You could read this as a Son Amy hint, sure, but to me it feels more like a peek behind the front. Sonic being vain in the day, but brought down when his friends don't recognize him, shows how happy he is with his own identity. He's proud of who he is, and not being able to be that anymore is terrible for him. God, and people think Sonic isn't trans, but this is pretty much all we see of this. At the end of the game when we learn Chip is like Gaia, Sonic posits that Chip's presence helped him keep his mind while so many people they'd met lost their minds to Dark Gaia's influence. There are two whole cutscenes and multiple optional missions specifically about it. Chip says, no, Sonic kept his mind through his own strength of will. It's always been inside of him. It feels like it's supposed to be the resolution to an arc about Sonic fearing for his own sense of identity, but these are pretty much the only two scenes that go into it. He barely has a reaction to the people affected by Dark Gaia. This isn't a waste purely because of its brevity, but because of how much a more fleshed out arc for him would mesh so well with Chips. There's already a lot of charm to their friendship throughout the game. It would have only strengthened their connection and sold that friendship even better to the audience. And I feel like there's a bit of subtext here too. After everything that happened in the previous decade, Sonic Team probably had a lot to think about regarding their own identity and what their games would look like going forward. Many of the old guard were long gone from Sega, including Naoto Oshima and most recently Yuji Naka. Takashi Izuka had no involvement in development for one of the few times since Sonic 3, and the company's standing in the game world was only slipping further and further down. The previous game ended up being the only one directed by Shun Nakamura or produced by Masahiro Kumono, who did not have a lot of experience in those roles, though Nakamura did co-produce one later game. Unleashed itself went on to be the only mainline 3D Sonic produced by Akinori Nishiyama or directed by Yoshihisa Hashimoto. The former would move on to work as a general manager for Sega, and the latter would leave Sega entirely. By the time of Colors, Izuka would be firmly in the producer's chair, and Morio Kishimoto would be the most recurring mainline director, both of them holding those spots to this day. A team in flux for several years. But even all the way to the rushed frontiers, the needlessly mishandled superstars, and now the Apple-exclusive Dream Team, Sonic's identity would continue to be in question with every frustrating design and business decision, especially by Sega and their whack-ass money-grubbing. The only consistently well-liked mainline games the whole of the 2010s were the two built around celebrating Sonic's past. A trick Sonic Team kept trying to repeat to rapidly diminishing returns. His latest two animated shows also continue the tradition of Sonic cartoons wanting so badly to be anything other than Sonic. Now, it's worth pointing out that Prime, Superstars, and Dream Team would have all been in production at the same time as Frontiers, so I don't think we'll actually see the effects of its success for a couple more years. We can only hope that what its success suggests, and even encourages going forward, is that the Hedgehog is finally happy being himself again. As we progress, there's a lot of charming little details in the game, along with the NPCs going through their own story arcs that I mentioned. There's also a traveling reporter from Empire City and an old woman from Apatos who both quiz you on the region you're in, and also Robbie Shapiro from Victorious sells you discount stolen goods. After the third Werehog stage, Professor Pickle gives you a camera you can use to exercise Dark Gaia from people at night in an enemy-clearing minigame. They're quick and easy. There's a collection of missions you can do for unique 
versions of Sonic's beloved chili dogs, but don't, they're awful. You spend rings you've managed not to lose on souvenirs and other types of food. The former go to Professor Pickle for hints about the levels and for more collectibles, hopefully medals if you're struggling for them. The latter can be fed to Sonic to increase his experience so you can power level him. Or fed to Chip to get some flavor dialogue and, if he likes the food, become better friends with him. Give him enough good food, and he'll give you three special CGI movies you can watch at the professor's office. We'll talk more about these in part five. Don't worry, I'm not about to ignore a cute ghost girl. But here's the big thing about Unleashed on the whole for me. By the time we've arrived in Adabad, completed the levels, beat Eggman once more, and recovered Chip's memory, I've spent a good 12 hours on this game, playing through the story, doing side quests, trying to see as much of it as I can, and the further on it goes, the more aggravated I get with it. Not just to play, because it's hard and janky in a way that cost me dozens of runs that's annoying in itself, but because the gameplay and design issues push back so hard against everything this game does really well. The art direction, the music, the feeling of speed, the life that this game gives off. There is no good reason that Unleashed shouldn't be one of Sonic's very best games. And it just stubbornly refuses to even be good. It's so hard for me to recommend to anyone because the longer the game goes on, the more its bad habits just become the core game design. Dodgy platforming that clashes with slippery controls, dying a lot just because the camera moved the wrong way. The long, boring, and obnoxiously repetitive Werehog stages. After a point, that's just all the game is. Which finally brings us to Eggman Land. This final stage has you alternate between the Hedgehog and the Werehog in some of the hardest challenges of the game. With all of the cheap deaths from needlessly difficult platforming that clashes with your slippery controls and your antagonist camera, the fastest and impossible to practice QTEs, and this thing can drag on for over 40 minutes. And you can still get an A rank from that after dying a dozen times. The game expects this! Now, I do like this place on paper. Eggman siphons Dark Gaia's energy and successfully builds his dream theme park on top of it. He's accomplished his first big dream, and it is as deadly and obnoxious as you'd expect. No child should ever be let loose in this place. It's just not fun to slog through. Same with the boss, the Egg Dragoon, where you're plummeting down a shaft for the first phase, and then arrive in the molten core of the Earth for the second. Really cool set piece. And it's the only time you fight Eggman as the Werehog. Usually you fight him as Daytime Sonic, but it's just another Werehog boss. And again, it drags on long past its welcome. And it isn't the last boss to do that either. So I know what you're thinking. Okay, Michaela, you don't like how Unleashed plays very much. Try the Wii version. Fine. Let's get into that. Look here. Do you see this sorry excuse for a sandwich? A reminder that I'm playing this emulated on Dolphin with a standard controller, since I'm actively trying to give this game its best chance. Playing with a Wii remote wouldn't be significantly different. All that would change is how you attack as the Werehog. Put a pin in it. Being a PS2 and Wii release, Dimps had the unenviable task of taking a hefty powerhouse of a game that not even the best consoles could play properly at the time, and paring it down for even weaker hardware. Visually, I think they did pretty well. It's very murky on PS2, but the Wii at least translates the art direction pretty nicely. It was never going to match the beautiful lighting, but you're not going to actively miss it. The town hubs were essentially removed, replaced with menus where you select an area of the map to check, and if someone there, they'll tell you something and possibly give you access to the next level, or give you items as you progress. It's less impressive, and the renders they used of everyone are almost exclusively the least flattering they could make, but I do like how this affects the importance of these characters. For that, let's back up a bit. You don't need to worry about sun and moon medals as much anymore, because they're not what unlocks each stage, and you don't collect them by hand anyway. They're simply your reward for playing a stage well. Getting a high score, a fast time, high ring count, high dark Gaia force count, etc. Get an S rank in a level and you get all three medals. 
Instead, levels are opened by obtaining sun or moon tablets from the locals, or just completing missions linearly. There it is! Completing the main acts of each city in daytime or nighttime gets you one half of a planet tablet, which allows you to reach the Gaia temples, but you can't combine the two pieces yourself. You need to talk to the NPCs and find out which one of them is the local guardian, since they know how to put the pieces together. None of these characters were important temple guardians in HD, or very important, period. This roll upgrade is minor in the long run, but I like that it makes these random NPCs matter to the story a little more, especially since the theme of a planet without borders was lost without any hub worlds or side quests. Continuing with things I like, you no longer have to worry about upgrading. The daytime levels are set with all of the skills you'll use, and the Werehog levels up based on how much Dark Gaia Force you collect. Every level requires a vastly different amount, but each one gives you a new combo, more health or unleashed meter, more damage, break enough shit throughout the game, and you shouldn't really need a grind at all. Daytime Sonic in particular feels pretty good to control. It's mostly the same as HD, but I feel like he's less chaotically slippery. It probably helps that I don't have to maneuver him around an overworld, just stages that feel like they were designed in a way that suits his movement better. There's not as much finicky platforming or annoying death traps, at least until the end. There's a better balance between the higher skill ceiling and the lower skill floor. Plus, the quick time events actually stay the same in a stage, though they might have a different combo in the alternate missions, but those combos will stay consistent between runs. That's like 10 points from me from the get-go. I also like how they adapted the bosses. They're mostly the same as in HD, but some of the complexity of the fight has been removed. This actually makes them much more streamlined, because usually they cut the more obnoxious, time-wasting gimmicks. Eggman's mechs are vulnerable quicker so you can attack him sooner. The Dark Moray is way faster without the smaller eels. The Dark Guardian is no longer about pushing blocks, but is instead just a throwdown brawl like it should have been. It doesn't mean these are necessarily fun, though, because SD Unleashed has its own control quirks. Sonic's boost meter can't be held down. Instead, you use it for individual bursts to get up to high speed. Funnily enough, that's kind of the ideal way to play the boost games anyway. The boost-to-win criticism they often got is inaccurate for several reasons, but chief among them is how the levels punish you for not paying attention or being ready to react. And if all you're doing is boosting, get used to falling to your death or impaling the hedgehog. Forces is mostly the exception until that one level for no clear reason. Instead, the best way to use your boost meter is in bursts to get yourself to top speed instantly, especially to recover if you stop. Unleash just takes out the middleman and forces you to play it that way from the get-go. You can even fill a free slot at the start of a stage by hitting the boost button right as Sonic says go, Mario Kart style. The boost does lock you into a direction for the most part, and it lasts longer than you might expect, so remember your drift if it's about to send you right into a hazard. But here's the kicker, and where we switch to my complaints. Dimp somehow managed to completely switch my opinions on the two playstyles for this version. Boost Sonic feels good to me. The Werehog feels like shit. If this is entirely an emulator issue, I will retract my following statement. But as I played it with an Xbox controller, and the game recognizing it as a GameCube controller, anything positive and negative I had to say about the Werehog in HD is worse here. Combat is now done with remote waggle, or with the controller's shoulder buttons, where you alternate each button for each arm. It's a cute idea, it works with the animations. It's also a much worse idea than putting the run button on R. Instead, you run by pushing the control stick in the same direction twice, which will often just not happen because of the awkward delay before it registers, and because your stick is oriented to the camera, which is even more of a problem now. Without a second stick to control it, it's completely locked into its rail, and so often it is in the most unhelpful place, sometimes not even looking where you are. It never feels like it's positioned where it should be, especially when you get to platforming. Depth perception is equally an issue here. Just running around and trying to platform with a Werehog, something I considered reasonably well done in HD, feels so much floatier and less precise. Like in HD, you do have a deceptively wide margin of error for grabbing things, but there's so much more of an uncomfortable delay to it. And here, you're required to hold the grab button down, otherwise Sonic just gives up. 
There's nothing in the way of the finicky tightrope walking, but you also have a lot less freedom and reliability of movement for climbing and sidling. Often the camera will be in a position where just climbing up from a ledge will be a needless ordeal because your control stick is no longer oriented in the direction you think it is. And the combat, which was at least done well enough in HD and simply overstayed its welcome, has all of its same flaws, but this time it's not done well! Enemies feel a lot more aggressive. Even the little doofy puppies will actually attack you frequently. And maybe that's how it should have been for HD, too. But we have a clunkier method of attacking here, and one hit makes you drop your combo entirely. So later levels, where you just get swarmed by enemies every two minutes, means that powerful Earth Shaker you just unlocked might as well not exist. You won't get the time to actually input the combo. One of the more reliable methods of combat I found was to break into a run, an issue unto itself, remember, and do the running claw swipe, which stuns enemies so you can attack them without issue, or pick them up to throw at the others. But there's so much delay and distance traveled on that swipe, you'll often just sail right past them, so it's still not actually very reliable. Just stick to basic punches. If you can, often the game will make you do the running swipe, even when you didn't want to. Some hyper armor during attacks would make these fights a lot less obnoxious, but not even Unleashed mode has it. It especially takes all the fun out of fighting both of the big guys, since the club guy has really tight tracking, and the round guy spawns dogs. At least the shockwave only knocks you down once this time. Literally, that might be the only improvement the Werehog has here. It is such a steep drop between versions, it's kind of heartbreaking. But the disappointment doesn't stop there. Missouri's stages were all cut for space, except for the hub and the egg beetle fight, while Empire City was cut entirely. Consequently, there are too many Werehog stages in Shamar and Adabat, easily the worst parts of the whole game, so I can't help but feel like something could have been trimmed to make room. Seriously, nighttime jungle joyride? Joyless. And this brings us to the Wii version of Eggman Land. By this point, even Daytime Sonic has become a struggle for me, and I had so little fun trying to get through this one that I just fucking gave up. Yep, I pulled a Free Riders again. It was not worth my time. I know there are people who swear by the Wii game, and I imagine part of that is because it actually ran like it was supposed to upon release. But in the present day, I think I pretty firmly prefer the HD version. This thing managed to be a special kind of drag. And I'm sorry to end this segment on such a sour note. Because the final boss in HD is shit too. It's just as the Gaia manuscripts foretold. If there is one really good thing about the final boss, it's that it makes an incredible impression. We've just defeated Egg Dragoon, and we get a gorgeous CG cutscene of Eggman throwing a tantrum, only for Dark Gaia himself to make his entrance. And slam Eggman out of the arena. Our heroes are ready for a fight, but things immediately go wrong, as Sonic is finally released from the curse of the Werehog at the worst possible time. <laughs> Chip. But not only does he not run, he summons all of the Gaia temples to him. Yeah, the actual buildings. He gathers them from across the world and forms a giant stone Voltron. This is up there as one of the most ridiculous, awesome things to happen in Sonic. At least it would be, if the actual fight was good. The problem with this boss is not that he's hard, he's really not when you figure out what to do. It's that it's unbelievably plotting. You start every round as far away from Dark Gaia as possible, which is almost insulting when the cutscenes end like this, and you must very slowly shove Chip forward while he takes his sweet ass time to punch away or dodge balls of molten magma. Getting to the boss each round is predicated on you not getting hit too much, so since Dark Gaia also blasts you with a very hard to dodge laser that you'll probably have to block, and too many hits beforehand will mean death. If there was any tactile feedback on dealing with these projectiles, or if, once again, the camera was placed in a way that I had any depth perception, it might not be such an ordeal. 
A full minute later, you do a very slow QTE beatdown until Dark Gaia grabs Chip, and then you take control of Sonic running down the mech towards one of the boss's eyes. These are probably the best part of the entire boss. They're tricky because they're short courses with lots of obstacles, but they're on an even shorter timer. And you of course do a QTE at the end, otherwise Sonic decides I don't wanna and dies. But they're the parts of this that are actually satisfying to pull off. Then you do all that shit all over again for two more rounds. If the idea was to convey the sheer scale of this fight by semi-realistically slowing the giants down, they completely fail to convey it. There's no weight to the animations to sell the size, no real anticipation or follow through on each action, so it just feels needlessly slow. Giganto's introduction, this is not. Assuming you don't die, this first phase of the boss can take upwards of 10 minutes on its own. And yes, it's only the first phase. And already I want to take a nap. Dark Gaia doesn't accept his defeat, and he covers the planet in darkness. This is the cutscene I mentioned, where the motion capture really fails the animators. Everyone looks less like Pixar and more like full-body sock puppets. Uh, what's happening? It was broad daylight a minute ago. Dark Gaia has regained its true power. The beast is complete. It's just as the Gaia manuscripts foretold, and the world shall be plunged into the dark of night, the dark of destruction. Oh, that it should come to this. We're doomed. The planet is lost. That won't happen. There's no way Sonic will let it end like this. Dark Gaia opens its mouth to reveal even more eyes, and Sonic gathers the Chaos Emeralds and goes super. We begin Phase 2. Perfect, Dark Gaia. Time to jump as far back as possible again before flying to the boss, but at least this time it's so we can gather rings to fill up our health first. Dark Gaia himself has released Dark Eels that power a shield around him, so Chip forces his way in to keep the boss distracted while we fly extremely jankily around the exterior to take them out. It's really anticlimactic in a completely new way and feels pretty bad to control, especially since the camera is once again fighting you the whole way, making you hit rocks you can't see and lose rings, plus the eels can randomly duck under the shield. And once they're cleared, we finish off Dark Gaia with, what else, another set of QTEs. I don't know the general consensus of this final boss. I do know people like its orchestral version of Endless Possibility, but for me, this is the last long, dragging fart at the end of a game that spent most of its playtime outstaying its welcome. And I'm not a fan of the music. It's a sloppy translation of the song, and it sounds weirdly dissonant to me. I don't like this boss, but Dark Gaia is finally defeated and melts back into the Earth's molten core. Sonic's power runs out and he faints from exhaustion, but Chip is there to catch him. Dark Gaia's influence recedes and the people of the world rejoice. Eggman's proto-orbot, SA-55, mocks him one too many times and seals his fate as this version is never seen again. Amy tells Professor Pickle, I told you so, and he tries to have the last word by driving home the theme of light and dark coexisting, which is frankly the less interesting and notable theme this game had. You're not Twilight Princess, guys. But now, it's time for Light Gaia to return to rest himself. How he does it is a little funnier than I think they intended. But in a cute bookend to the start of the game, Sonic lands face first in the same spot where he met Chip. And despite everything, it's a surprisingly affecting, bittersweet ending. Huh? I'll never forget you. I'll be here by you, always. A part of the Earth you dream. Ah! 
As the credits roll, we get one of Sonic's best post-Crush 40 theme songs, Endless Possibility. Though as I've hinted before, I far prefer the newer Nathan Sharp version. Jarrett Reddick doesn't sound nearly as into it, and the double tracking on his voice is not flattering. Alongside the credits, screenshots and unique photographs from Sonic and Chip's adventure appear, and... Man, for as flawed as this game is, and it's incredibly flawed, seeing all these memories on display still leaves me with a longing, nostalgic feeling. I really bought Sonic and Chip's friendship, and the highs in this game can get pretty damn high. This really feels like a good buy. I just wish more of those highs were in the actual gameplay, and that there weren't so many cavernous lows. The second song is fine. I called much of Frontiers a mixed bag, but it doesn't hold a candle to Unleashed. And watching these credits and walking away from it from the third or fourth time at this point, I'm realizing the parts of this game that stuck with me have less to do with actually playing the game. It's the music, it's the world, it's the friendship between the two protagonists. There's a lot of heart and soul in Unleashed, it just ends up carried around by a very clumsy body. So I think it's fitting that the last thing I want to talk about before we wrap up the video is... Well, want to watch a movie? Like I mentioned, there are three CGI shorts in the game, animated by Marza Animation Planet, who also did the intro, most of the Sonic intros starting with 06, and CGI commercials up to the present day. They're a very good animation team, and they understood the assignment for Unleashed. Classic slapstick cartoons. These are simply Sonic and Chip and Chunnan, Halaska, and Adabat, with a focus on food and somebody getting hurt in some comical way. My favorite is the first, where the two do this silly chopsticks battle for the last dumpling, since it's a kind of playing around people do with their good friends. And Sonic really gets to show off his cocky smartass side. He nearly dies in the third one. These essentially have no dialogue, just reaction sounds and laughs, and that's all they really need. These are just pure charm in a very classic Disney shorts kind of way. Though, despite Chip being essentially designed for this art style, he ends up looking more off-model and uncanny the more they do with him. Which brings us to something I deliberately skipped until now, because I was saving it for this section. Remember what I said about the game's intro? Shadow and 06 had great CGI cutscenes, sporadic as they were, but this one tops them easily by feeling like a Sonic short film. Turns out Sega agreed because they had Marza actually make one. November 17, 2008, the day before the game's release, Sega premiered a 12-minute promotional short that Feels like it should have been a Halloween special, but here we are. Sonic, Night of the Werehog. Essentially a Sonic short film starring him and Chip as they just let themselves into a haunted house and clash with the resident ghosts. Except these ghosts want intruders. This is Ooh and Sue, the competing, simping husbands of the beautiful lady of the manor, La. La's favorite thing is hilarious photographs of terrified trespassers. Her fan wiki page was written by an incel. Whichever one of the guys scares people the best and brings her the funniest photo, gets a much sought after kiss on the cheek and their picture pinned to the wall. A wall that includes a poster for a classic Wolfman film. Enter Sonic and Chip, who don't seem to have any clear goal here except to check the place out and steal a hot drink. I think it's just to get out of the rain. Ooh and Sue manage to give Chip a good fright, who is again not served by the animation as much as he should have been. But to La's frustration, Sonic doesn't give them an inch. They go back to the pair and double their efforts, possessing suits of armor and threatening them right as the full moon reveals itself through parted clouds. Sonic freezes and quivers, not in fear, but in pain, as he transforms into the Werehog. Even the ghosts are shocked and run away in fear, much to the hero's confusion. Unfortunately for them, they took pictures of themselves, which Law finds even more hilarious, so they quadruple their efforts to take this guy down. The second half of the short is an extended fight scene between Sonic and a fusion of the two ghosts into a demonic specter, which he usually can't see unless he uses their camera. An obvious tie-in to one of the game's mechanics that never actually helps him, whoops. The ghosts manage to knock him out, but they fight over which one of them gets to take the photo, giving Sonic time to wake up, slam them through the second floor, and punch them into the full moon. Law is treated to one last picture, featuring the werehog's deadly badassery, and she is more than happy with it. 
The next morning, as Sonic and a heart-cheeked Chip leave the manor, Chip stops Sonic and insists on taking one more photo with him. He begrudgingly agrees, and the developing picture reveals that it was actually La getting her own selfie with her favorite monster. Sonic never sees the real Chip again. I watched Night of the Werehog for the first time just before Halloween 2023, less than a month before this video went up, and the combination of the season and just how good the film is meant I had a blast with it. This is such a fun, beautifully animated send-up of classic spooky animation. My patrons and I got big Casper and old-school Disney vibes from it, perfect for October not November when it was released. The stars of the show are really the animators at Marza. Like their intro and unlockable shorts for Unleashed, this film was lovingly animated, expressive, and dynamic. Some of the faces don't translate, making it clear how much this is absolutely not Disney. It's also extremely light on voice acting, like the in-game shorts, only including a few complete spoken words. Oops and instead leaning more on pantomime. This is a little awkward considering we know you can talk and it would be a lot faster, Chip, but I didn't mind it much at all. This is a film where the action does all the talking it needs. Give it a watch next October and steal some coffee for yourself. Fittingly, like how this video is for the game's 15th anniversary, Marza did the same thing for Halloween 2023 and released a brand new short starring the ghosts. It's also very cute and deals less with action and more on wholesomeness. No Sonic, but the three ghosts were apparently breeding all this time. Congratulations on the babies. I hope they weren't children they killed. We're traveling through time and space! Following Unleashed's mixed to negative reception and the continued shakeups at Sonic Team, Pieces of its foundation carried on through later 3D entries. Except Lost World, which is a brazen Mario ripoff. I know that's a cliche way to say it, but I played it recently and it's almost an understatement. If it wasn't on the Wii U, Nintendo could sue. Anyway, obviously the big thing that was dropped completely was the Werehog and his playstyle. Sonic never really dabbled with hack and slash like this again, at least as of this video. The closest is really the combat in Frontiers, which incorporates combos for flashy attacks, though this time Sonic doesn't need to transform to know how to punch. Knuckles might. Eggman's new robot, SA-55, would be refined once more into Orbot, who would be his go-to sassy lackey all the way up to present day, and even be a prominent character in Boom. But someone at Sonic Team thought he wasn't enough on his own, so he was paired up with the idiotic Q-Bot, who is much more outwardly comic relief. I like them in Boom. That's it. The one thing about Unleashed that truly stuck was the boost gameplay, which went on to be the de facto 3D Sonic style all the way up to Sonic Forces in 2017, with wide gulfs in playability, unnecessary gimmicks, and quality of level design. Generations is the most lauded of this period, but that uncomfortable looseness in Sonic's controls persisted, to the point that I actually don't enjoy playing it much more than Unleashed, and it's certainly nowhere as charming or substantive. Forces would probably play the tightest if it wasn't a half-hearted tax write-off masquerading as a war story. They wasted Eggman winning and successfully taking over the world on Sonic Forces. I will never get over that. When Takashi Izuka took over as the driving force of Sonic Team around 2010, that coincided with a massive dumbing down of the franchise that persisted through the entire rest of the decade. Fans often blame this on this period's main English writers, Pontac and Graf, but hindsight should make it clear that it was never their fault. This was a company-wide effort to cool off on the dramatic stories in favor of a much more lowest common denominator cartoony tone, light, silly, and safe, so they could focus on bringing Sonic back in a better standing in the game world, and it went on for so long and was done so poorly that it frankly just did more damage. If half of the Boom show is any indication, then the only industry that really cared about Sonic anymore was comics and even they could only do so much. For me, it wasn't until Sonic Frontiers, when the boost style was finally molded into a form I actually found consistently enjoyable, despite issues that were still present. They did that by taking that loose, finicky gameplay, tightening it up a lot more, plus more options for the player, and putting Sonic into levels with much more freedom to explore. A high-speed franchise like this needs a lot more space than it tends to get, 
Cyberspace is the exception, but I even found those easier to get used to than the previous games. But most tellingly, the writing did away with the half-assed gags and focused on the characters and their relationships, mystery and intrigue, and embracing the shonen action anime blood that's been running in this hedgehog's veins since he first went Super Saiyan three decades ago. Not only can he work in a more serious, story-driven context, it suits him much better than lazy comedy. The story had hardened ambition, the music was widely eclectic, and pushed all kinds of boundaries on what could be considered sonic music. It's a game with plenty of its own flaws, but it was the first mainline 3D Sonic in over a decade where it felt like everyone tried. And this brings us all the way back to Unleashed, because for over a decade, this was the last mainline 3D Sonic to feel like that. I have no doubts that everyone did try with the games in between, but it sure didn't feel like it. But also like Frontiers, there's a heart and ambition present in Unleashed that I just don't get from any of his 3D games from the 2010s. It raises the hypothetical of what Sonic would have looked like if Akinori Nishiyama and or Yoshihisa Hashimoto kept their positions into the next decade. Sonic is frequently criticized for not sticking with a formula long enough to actually refine it, but a question that I think gets lost in that discussion is just who are the driving forces behind each new game? The mere fact that Izuka kept the boost system to refine it is surprising in the first place since he was not involved in Unleashed at all. Would the spark and ambition that we saw from Nishiyama and Hashimoto have brought us to something like Frontiers even sooner? But then we have to remember, money is also a factor, and if the games weren't selling or reviewing well, pulling back the ambition was probably Sonic Team's only choice from here. And that sense of resignation that I get about those possibilities mirrors how I feel about Unleashed. Because despite how endearing I find it and how stellar its world and music are, it has a lot of flaws that are serious deal-breakers for me. It and everything surrounding it leaves me with possibly the most varied emotions of any Sonic game. Frontiers left me with the most complicated, unleashed with the most varied. It's a pocket of Sonic where there's so much to recommend that is equally cancelled out by how little I recommend playing it. Sonic Unleashed is not the masterpiece people like to call it now. Gorgeous as it is, for me it will only ever be the Boost Era's first big clumsy step. Both versions of the game, impressive for the time as I'm sure they were, are also littered with gameplay issues that have only aged poorly. But if it just had that speed adjustment menu and a much better camera, it could be the best Sonic game right now. Of course, there are plenty of games where their biggest fans are able to look past their controls and recommend them for their other strengths. Games even older than Unleashed, like the classic Silent Hills or the two Mega Man Legends. If the gameplay isn't a deal breaker for you, and you don't just want to look up videos and streaming for everything, then I can recommend Unleashed for its good parts, and especially those shorts, all of which have aged really well. Not the humans. But as it stands here 15 years later, it holds a unique position in this franchise to me, and you can take this as optimistic or backhanded, either is fair. A lot of Sonic games don't really hold special places in my heart, even the agreed-upon classics. And the ones that do are either really good, but I'm bad at them, or aren't that great, but I am good at them. Frontiers is the big exception. I do genuinely consider it a great game, and I am good at it. Unleashed, on the other hand, is the only Sonic game I can think of where my biggest attachment to it is how much I wished I loved it. I want to feel the same way about it that I do about Frontiers, the same way that its biggest fans do. Its potential shines so bright in my mind, its good parts so good, but it just steadfastly refuses to let me love it. I have plans to stream Unleashed for my Let's Play channel, The Straw Hat No. But after that, I don't expect to revisit it enthusiastically. Not even the best version we have now at 60 FPS. My ideal way to play it would be a PC port or a mod with an overhauled control scheme and the Werehog levels all at half length. You can even keep the medals, they're far from my biggest gripe. But for what could be any number of reasons, from licensing to porting issues, this has yet to really happen. There's a masterpiece sticking out of this pile of dog hair on freshly mopped linoleum, and though Unleashed couldn't fully reach its own potential, I also don't think its successors could either. Even Frontiers, as much as I love that game, there is a spark to Unleashed that is wholly its own. But if modders were finally able to make Free Riders playable without the Kinect, I'll get to it eventually, then maybe there's still hope for a perfect version of Unleashed. 
and I hope someone someday is able to reach out and grab it. I wouldn't mind another look after that. Yeah.